Okay, hello and welcome to the Market Maker Podcast. This is episode 104. And today I've got two topics to talk about with Piers Curran, who is the co-founder of Amplify Me. And we're going to talk about Jerome Powell's testimony to Congress, arguably the biggest by far macro event, because his moves have triggered a cross-asset class response. And that meaning, in simple terms, Stocks are down, and quite aggressively so in the US. So we'll talk about why and what's happened and obviously what this means for interest rates because the event from the FOMC is looming in just about two weeks' time or so. And then the other headline story capturing attention at the end of the week, SVB Financial, holding company for Silicon Valley Bank. Some of you might have heard of them. I'm guessing most of you haven't. Um, but what happened was a collapse in their share price, and that sparked a degree of contagion among financial stocks. Yesterday, we did see the big four U.S. banks, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP City. They were down ranging from 4 to 6.5% and actually saw around $50 billion worth of market value wiped off their share price It just yesterday alone on the back of SVB. So how does that happen? We'll explain. But let's dive in with Jerome Powell. So to set the scene, the the way that this operates, so the Fed have eight meetings per year, just to set the scene. This is where they'll officially set monetary policy. In between this, they have the semi-annual testimony. So this is where Jerome Powell will basically report back to politicians. Now, just to be clear, the central bank and the government operate independently or should do in the best oh, yeah. intention to do so in the western world at least um, but the what makes this slightly convoluted is that although there's independent thinking at the central bank in the end the central bank has to report back to congress and this is one of these events and it's always been a platform whereby historically if so required, the central bank head or the chair, in this case, Jerome Powell, can use it as a staging post to sort of set out his latest forward guidance. And so the Federal Reserve, he said, would likely need to raise interest rates more than expected in response to recent strong data and is prepared to move in larger steps if the totality of incoming information suggests tougher measures are needed to control inflation. Does that summarize all anyone needs to know, or is there more that people should be aware of? Uh, that summarizes it. I think that what you've just said, that's it. I mean, basically, <laughs> this, so Powell, you know, in these um, semi-annual testimonies, you know, I mean, how long does it last? What was it, like an hour and a half or something? Did it's you, pretty lengthy, generally, yeah. It's a pretty lengthy thing, right? And what he does is he, he delivers a statement a pre-prepared statement at the start, then all the senators start grilling him. And if you've ever watched one of these things, which, which unfortunately I have, um, <laughs> my, my Lord, it's, you get these, I mean, all right, some of the senators are quite savvy. They mm -hmm. understand the world of economics and they understand the world of markets and therefore they understand interest rates from a sort of markets and economics perspective others have just got no idea which is fair enough they're not from an economics background so you get these senators these like 70 year old senators just banging on about something entirely irrelevant and they just use it as a bit of a platform for themselves mm. to basically say stuff that their their electorate will like and it has such a dull event anyway it was about an hour and a half yesterday all you needed to know was in the first five minutes and that was in his pre-prepared statement mm. and i don't know i'm i was quite surprised that the market well i don't know i i would say that without the svb bank uh situation this week i i would say yes markets sold off on tuesday but then they were they were kind of stabilizing before now we've got this latest story on SVB, which has taken things another leg lower. So I think there was a negative fallout in stocks, what Powell said, but it wasn't a huge one. And that's because what he said wasn't particularly surprising. We've known all of this. That's why we've been selling off for the whole month of February. You know, we know that 
data out of the US has shown that the US economy is way more resilient than we thought. Therefore, inflation is going to stay higher. Therefore, the Fed are going to hike rates more. And I, I guess the only thing about it yesterday was just how explicit he was about the fact that there's a rate hike acceleration is back on the table. So to quote him exactly, he said, if the totality of the data were to indicate that faster tightening is warranted, we would be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. Now, I mean, that is very, very, very clear language, which is very unusual for a mm. central banker. It's, it's funny, though, because actually step out of the of the situation and just think about what he's just said if data comes in strong we're going to have to tighten faster it's like well yeah it's funny how markets are so behavioral it's just this yeah this this uttering of like we could go faster bang everyone just starts selling at that point and then it's like well it is there is a condition to this and there is major data coming down the pipe right there's literally right. non-farm payrolls which is Today. Super key is later today from when we're recording this. And then you've got US CPI on Tuesday next week. Yeah. So but I would say those two pieces of information mm. will entirely determine what the Fed does on the 22nd of March, which is when their meeting is. Yeah. And so if these two pieces of information come in strong, they're going to hike 50 basis points. Powell just told us. Um, now, the probability of a 50 hike at the March meeting went from a 30% chance to a 70% chance off the back of his comments. So, yeah, there's been a pretty major shift in near term rate expectations. Yeah, federal funds rate futures now have actually leveled off. It's 50 50 price now. Okay. So it, it, it swung then. from 30 on Monday up to 70 plus. And it's dropped back to about 54 now. So yeah, but but actually, the other thing to contemplate here is, um, I think he's done he's done a good job. He's done the right thing because there's the blackout period. This was actually one of his last right. moments to communicate, and he's communicated that look, there's data coming. Everyone knows that, and there's no point us. I don't think speculating because the question would be, what do you think? Twenty five fifty. It's like I don't need to guess. Let's just wait. And the data yeah. will tell me 25 or 50, basically. And I, I think the reason that probability dropped back down a bit was because of data we had yesterday, where we had initial jobless claims from the US, which just tracks the number of new applicants for you know, jobless support um, each week. And it came in at 211,000. Why is that important? Well, it's the first time that number has been above 200,000 since mid-December. Um, so, you know, about well above what was expected. So that, that's kind of maybe the first chink in the armour of this super strong labour market. Maybe mm. that jobless claims kind of just points to, well, a turning point and, and perhaps now that labour market's going to start to, to mm. weaken. Maybe. I mean, we're going to get the non-farm payrolls data today. And I think the big argument is that the, the one kind of last bit of hope you know, if you're if you're wedged in massively long stocks and you've taken a big hit in the last month as we've pivoted on our rate high expectations, then your last ray of hope is the argument that the January jobs data was only strong because the weather in the northeast of the US was much milder than normal in that month. And the northeast of the US makes up 20% of the whole US economy. So was it the milder weather that led to the strong jobs number? We're going to find out today because we're going to get the February reading and the weather definitely, you know, I was in New York a couple of weeks ago and it definitely was not mild. So you're going to see that weather argument finally get put to rest today one way or the other. Yeah. So the headlines expected at 200, it's got a range 78 to 325 at the high. ADP came out, which is often seen as the precursor for this, is private payrolls. That beat expectations, came in at 242,000 early this week against market estimates of 200. I did see one stat, and I was just looking at the a chart, but to average out the numbers, basically ADP 
has dramatically under forecast the BLS's official job gains for months. It's the best reverse indicator you can possibly get. <laughs> yeah. In ge- like to, to, put, to put that into context, the, so the ADP, they're trying to measure just private job creation, right, in the private sector. Non-farm payrolls is private and public sectors, right? The ADP number in January was 119,000, the lowest reading for well over 12 months. In that same month, the non-farm payrolls came in double expectation and was like the highest reading in many months, right? So yeah, I wouldn't be looking at that ADP report and drawing any conclusions whatsoever. And if any, Mm. using it as a reverse indicator. Okay. We'll see. This is, that's for educational purposes, <laughs> not for investment <laughs> advice, I must stress. Um, but look, let's jump on to the other story. So SVB Financial, and let's kick it off with who exactly is Silicon Valley Bank? Yeah, well, as the name probably suggests, they're, well, probably the best way to describe it, they're the bank for tech startups in Silicon Valley. Um, and yeah, their share price tanked, cratered, whatever word you want to roll out, dropped 60% yesterday. Okay. Not and a great why? <laughs> <laughs> Like why would, would, would a company basically have such a meteoric decline like that? Yeah, well, I think there's two, there's a, the big question, we'll go into why, the big question is, I mean, they're, they're quite, I mean, I, I was going to say they're quite a small bank, and, and, and they are when you put them alongside the giants like JP Morgan and, and Bank of America and the rest, but they are the 16th biggest bank in the US. So, you know, we're not messing about here. Um, so the, the, the question is, well, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank? Could that happen to the other banks, the big boys? And, and that right there is the critical question. But what happened here specifically to SVP? I think on the one hand, they are a bit unique, um, which is why we perhaps shouldn't get too alarmed yet about this being a contagion thing that leads to you know big issues across the financial sector. But um, so the thing about their, their bank is they've got an unusually high proportion of business depositors. So look, go back to the basics here. A bank takes in deposits, right? And normally a bank would have um, consumers, individuals that is depositing money, you know, where do you put your paycheck every month in your bank account, right? So all this money, all these deposits are coming in all the time. So you either have consumers or you have businesses, okay? So you have a business bank account, of course. And so in there you're depositing your money, right? Now SVP have a very unusually high proportion of business depositors compared to individual consumer depositors. That's number one really important differentiator from the big guns like JP Morgan, for example. We'll come back to why that's important in a second. What happened in the financial, uh, sorry, what happened in, in COVID? In 2021, particularly, investors went crazy pumping money into tech startups. Mm. And it was one of the biggest years, well, no, sorry, not one of, it was the biggest year ever for investors funding tech startups, right? Where do these startups put the money? So when the investment comes in, right, great, we've done a capital raise, perfect, right, now we're gonna execute our growth strategy. But of course, you don't spend all that money, bang, in one go, you put it in the bank, and then you spend that money in the months ahead as you're deploying your growth strategy, right? So what happened to Silicon Valley Bank is their deposits went through the roof, in 2021 okay now normally what a bank does their model they take in deposits and then they take that money and then they lend it okay and we talked about net interest income that's the their profit margin basically so how much are they paying their depositor versus how much are they generating in income from lending that money out okay now the problem that silicon valley bank had was that they that the the rate at which deposits was increasing was so rapid they just didn't have the capacity and actually there wasn't even the demand to lend that money out the other side, okay? So what did they do? They instead invested that money into 
government bonds and mortgage-backed securities because they wanted to generate a return from that money that was higher than the deposit interest they're paying to their customer. Okay, And the only way to do that, they had to buy safe assets Okay, because they couldn't lend it. They had too much money. Right. So that, that's the premise, right? This is in 2021. The issue they had is they bought super long term and they bought, they, they put it in their hold to maturity portfolio. Okay. They kind of wedged in on a fixed rate return. Okay. Now, the issue was that then interest rates started to ramp higher in 2022. Now, if you're holding bonds, then what happens if interest rates go up? Well, bond yields go up. Okay, but that means bond prices go down. So they got locked in at, at a relatively very low yield in 2021. And so then their securities portfolio is suffering as prices drop in 2022 as the Fed hikes rates. Okay, so now suddenly they're losing money on their securities book. Um, so What's now happened to compound this is investors have stopped investing in tech startups, number one. So there's less new deposits coming in. Number two, businesses are very um, conscious of the rate of return they're getting on their deposits. And if your bank account isn't providing you with anything particularly meaningful, then the CFOs in these businesses will take the money out of the bank account and they'll buy government bonds to generate a higher return on their cash. OK, but this now means deposit withdrawals. So SVB Bank has seen deposit withdrawals just as their offsetting kind of securities book has declined in value. And so what they've had to do is sell some of these securities that they bought. Now, the problem is these were marked to market on their book at the prices they bought at in 2021. Prices have gone south. So they've had to sell their position at a quite a big loss. OK, and this was all revealed yesterday. And they've had to issue new shares to cover this kind of shortfall. And all of a sudden, everything's gone a bit panicky. And so their stock dumped 60%. So the contagion effect then, is that appropriate or was that an overreaction in what we saw yesterday with the big boys? I think it's a very hard question to answer. The initial reaction is contagion. And you've seen, as you were saying at the start, you've seen all the big banks, you know, come off really sharply yesterday. In fact, to put that into context, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, the sell off in JP Morgan shares, um, wiped, uh, what was it? I've got, I did have the stat, I don't know where it is now. Oh yeah, here we go. So JP Morgan's um, valuation declined 22 billion yesterday because its share price dropped 5.4%. So 22 billion, that 22 billion loss from JP Morgan's valuation, that's more than double the entire valuation of the whole of SVB. Yeah. Um, so you definitely, you've definitely had a big move across the sector because you know, obviously other banks are also invested in these. They've done the same thing, right? In 2021, deposits went up and maybe they couldn't lend that money out. So they bought securities. But what I would say is a couple of differences, which hopefully will mean this contagion thing is temporary and then things stabilize and go back to normal. That's what should happen. We'll talk about why it might not happen in a minute, but it should happen because for a start, SVB is unusual in having a very large proportion of business depositors. Most other banks don't. Mostly their deposit base is, is consumers. Consumers historically are just way less savvy and can't be asked, to be honest, to change their bank, right? Mm. So they don't go around going, oh, I'm only getting 1.05% interest on my bank account here, right? I can get, I, if I bought, two-year US government bonds, I could get 5%. Right, I'm going to take all my money out and I'm going to buy bonds. They just don't do it because they don't know about it or they just don't have time, right? So normally, so these bank, these other big banks, they're not seeing deposit withdrawals like you're seeing SVB um, take on. Secondly, um, these banks have not invested as much um, to the proportion of the banks 
um, book um, on the asset side is much smaller in terms of their investments into these you know, locked in long term securities. Um, but that doesn't mean to say they haven't invested in those at all. They have. And this has shown that the value of those assets that they've got on their book are possibly lower um, if they were forced to sell like SVB were then maybe those assets aren't worth as much, which is probably what you saw in yesterday's share prices. You know, investors just adjusting the value of those assets, right? Um, now, it shouldn't go any further than this, but you were around in 2008, and, you know, panic is irrational, and, you know, this is where logical sense goes out of the window. Um, so the question is, are we at a 2008 moment? Uh, if I'm a betting man, I'd say no, but that doesn't mean to say the risk of that is zero because it's definitely not. Right. So <clears throat> how I would have done my job in my previous life before Amplify, because right now this would be like the hot focus yeah. and I guess the market to me is quite is going to be in today's session specifically, although there's payrolls, which might absorb a lot of the attention as it naturally does. And it's important as we discussed, but today specifically, just given the aftermath of what happened with the bank stocks, I would be super conscious of a rumor doing the rounds where a big bulge bracket bank might get named. Yeah. I would be actively now talking to my contacts to try and get ahead of that for any feelings on who this could be and some of the just getting under the bonnet a little bit that you can't find through a Bloomberg terminal. And that would be me doing my job then to try and yeah. arm you, the trader, with the intel to answer that question. Is there going to be another? Um, and the important point there is, as you rightly said, psychologically or behaviorally, it doesn't need to be another. There just needs to be speculation yeah. that there's someone else at risk. That's all it would take is not 16th largest US bank. But if we break into the top 10, top five, then you've got some serious issues because for that session alone and that moment in time, you probably would get a repeat type move in the market. Might, if it doesn't transpire to be anything, which is probably likely then to be the case, because of, as you said, they're generally a more diversified business. That doesn't mean that there's not short term opportunity before then the dust settles. So I Absolutely. think today is really important from an information I, flow point of view. I don't want to be too sensationalist, but I'm going to be. Uh, this next week, mm. in fact, today and Tuesday, well, let's call it yesterday today and Tuesday could be a phantom, the most important five day period of the whole of 2023. There you go. I've could never, it. could never tell, that, it. could never tell that you're a trader. You were about to say fantastic then, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> look, I can see the dollar signs in your eyes when I you, mean, look, uh... <laughs> the, VIX, the VIX is up 30% here, right? There is, can take that people have panicked a little bit. There's a little mm. bit of a panic, not, not mm. massive. If you layer on top a, a potential banking crisis, if you layer on top a really strong non-farm payrolls number and a higher than expected CPI reading on Tuesday, then our rate hike expectations continue to rise. The very thing that has put SVB or one of the things that's put SVB in trouble. So if, if yields on bonds rise further, off the payrolls reading and the inflation reading, SVP, SVB, their problem gets worse. And then this panics people a bit more about the others. Mm. And so I'm just saying it, it has the potential. Now, it could be that the payrolls number today is soft, much weaker than expected. It could be the CPI number drops quite sharply, in which case let's all take a breath and everything's fine. But yeah. This is, this is the moment. If you're interested in markets, you need to be all over this data this afternoon and on Tuesday afternoon because it, is, it couldn't be more important. Okay, and for anyone listening, that is Piers Curran getting mega excited. <laughs> <laughs> this is as far as he gets. 
<laughs> All right. Well, look, on that note, I know that you're on client site today. So I'll let you go and let you crack on with the day. But uh, thanks for giving up some time. Always a pleasure. Enjoy the weekend. All right. Take care, everyone. Yeah. See you.